Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 13th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019 and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. Agenda item one today is consideration of whether to take agenda item three in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. That is agreed. Agenda item two, the committee will take evidence from the Accounts Commission on its report entitled Local Government in Scotland Challenges and Performances 2019. Today's session will contribute to the committee's overall scrutiny of the budget for local authorities throughout this financial year. And I'd like to welcome Graham Sharp, Chair, and Fraser McKinley, Controller of Audit, Accounts Commission, Claire Sweeney, Audit Director, and Ashley Magite, Senior Auditor, Audit Scotland. I invite Graham Sharp to make a short opening statement. Okay. Thank you. The Accounts Commission welcomes the opportunity to discuss its report to Local Government in Scotland Challenges and Performance 2019 with the Committee. It is the Commission's annual commentary on key issues in the local government sector. Councils face an increasingly complex, changing and uncertain environment. This places different demands and expectations on them. They are also central to delivering many high-level public sector objectives such as the integration of health and social care and community empowerment. These changes will require councils to collaborate with a range of partners and with communities to think differently about how they deliver and fund services. This is important if they are to meet the growing demand and changing needs of their communities. Councils need to ensure they have the leadership, staff capacity and skills to deliver change. This will require effective workforce planning. We find the quality of planning to be inconsistent and nationally workforce data are insufficient to understand how individual services have been affected by workforce changes, recruitment difficulties and an ageing workforce. Scottish Government funding has remained relatively stable over 2018-19 and 19-20. However, it has reduced in real terms by 6% since 2013-14. National policy initiatives continue to make up an increasing proportion of council budgets. This reduces the flexibility councils have for deciding how they plan to use funding. At the same time, the demand for council services is increasing from a changing population profile. Councils have made good pro progress in developing medium-term financial planning and continue to manage their funding gaps through savings and the use of reserves. All councils increased council tax in 2018-19, including 12 by the maximum of 4.8%, and many councils also increased their fees and charges. Some councils are looking at other options to raise income. Despite reducing funding and increasing demands, across local government, most performance indicators are improving or have been maintained, although some service areas show more strain and satisfaction levels have fallen. Councils should make better use of data and benchmarking to understand the performance variation between councils and make further improvements or efficiencies. We make recommendations in this report which are directed at both senior managers and councillors whose role continues to become more complex and demanding. We highlight that to improve outcomes for their communities, councils need to be open to transformational change and implement new ways of working. Finally, there is substantial change in the environment within which councils operate. The Commission continually considers how its work reflects that changing environment, and this annual overview report is intended to be a helpful summary of evidence from a wide range of local government audit work carried out. It cannot realistically cover everything and is not a comprehensive review. However, it highlights the key challenges councils face and looks at some of the main ways councils are responding to increasing demand and reduced funding. We are always prepared to discuss our reports with the committee to help it in its work. And convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham Simpson. Thanks. Um, so Mr Sharp uh, mentioned a 6% 6, 6 cut in funding to councils in real terms since 2013-14. Um, uh, and of course there are, there are different ways to uh, approach figures and come up with figures. I wonder if you can uh, explain your approach, how you came up with that figure. The, the, the detail of, of the calculation. Ashley, do you want to take, um, th take through that? Yeah, that, so this is the total revenue funding, which is the general resource grant, the specific revenue grants, and the non-domestic rates income. And these are all set out in the circulars. 
um, we've compared the circulars from 2019-20 uh, to 2013-14, and, and that's the difference. Okay. Um, we, on a, a number of occasions, this, this committee uh, has heard you know, different people argue that fig figures are different. Is it, uh, does everyone accept that this 6% figure is accurate? I, 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 I don't think there's any dispute it, it's accurate. I, I think there are different views on, on certain factors that should be included or excluded. Um, uh, one area where um, there has been difference in the past is, is the amount of money that, that goes to IJBs through uh, NHS. Um, I think in the, in the current year in which we're reporting, that's 375 million. Um, and our approach is and always has been that as that comes through the NHS to IJBs, it's not included in our figures for local government. And indeed, since it is included in the NHS figures, if we included it in local government, we'd be counting the same number twice. So um, it, it goes in one place, and, th and that's the NHS. Right, so, that, so the IJB money isn't included in that? In that the 375 million isn't. Okay. But the, I mean, the, the local government element that, 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 that is attributed to IGBs is. So, if, uh, can, I, can I just ask, um, so that, obviously that 6% was since 2013-14. What did, what, what did you notice this, this past year? Has the trend continued or was it, was it stopped? Well, I think, um, if I can refer you to Exhibit 2, I, I think shows shows the pattern. And I think if you take the last two years, um, it's been relatively flat with a 0.4% uh -huh. increase over the, the, two, the two years, which in effect is, is flat. Uh, it's slightly complicated because of a change in accounting practice between our previous visit to, to, to this committee and, uh, and this. Um, and, and that drops out if you look at the two years together, where you see 0.4% over two years is flat. So it's 0.6% over the last six years, but, but relatively flat over the last two years. 6%, not 0.6%. Not Sorry, 6% over the last um, so six years. So we've had a, a reduction since 2013, but the last two years it's, flat, it's, flat. it's flattened it's, it's out. It's 0.4% so positive okay. over the two years together. Right, that's, that's very useful. Thank you. Um, so compared to 2017-18, uh, the total funding gap across uh, all councils in 2018-19 reduced by uh, 0.1 billion to 0.3 billion. So what, what do you see as the implications of this for council services? Uh, well, as I say, it's been relatively flat, and, and we reported in the financial overview, uh, which we, we discussed uh, w w with the committee in, in December, that um, with councils uh, taking uh, other action and, and increasing council tax and fees and charges, the, the actual money to councils had, had been stable over that period. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, can I just ask a question on that? Um, you talk about the figures being accurate, uh, and I'm sure they are accurate, sorry, uh, in terms of what you're looking at, but it's not really accurate in terms of what local authorities are getting. Well, um, here we're looking at a specific element of, of what, what, what they get, which is the, the, their, their main source of income. Um, I think it's about 55% uh, from, from government. It obviously doesn't include fees and charges or, or council tax. I think we make that clear. Yes, yeah. but even the, the IGB money is, is not included in this, which is a sum that goes... Well, the 375 isn't, that's because correct. that's yes. included in, yeah. in NHS money. So. so it's part of the problem, then, that there's a lack of clarity sometimes about the amount of money that gets paid into local... No, sometimes. Uh, that gets paid into local authorities. Um, I, I think sometimes uh, for different... D different groups for different purposes are using different definitions, which which can lead to lack of clarity. Yeah, it's just trying to get the because obviously the headline figures are, you know, there's the, the six percent cut when the reality might be that there's not six percent cut. There's only six percent cut if we use this method of uh, calculating it right. Uh, and, and this is not having a go at you. I mean, you're go you're working on what you've been asked to work with. It's just trying to 
to highlight the fact that there's, there may be other monies coming in that uh, are not being taken into account. There, there are other monies going into the IGBs through through the NHS, and, and then it becomes more of a, I think, a, a sort of policy question about how you view IGBs. Do, do you view their money as local authority money and, and NHS money, or do you view it as IGB money? Okay. Right. Well, that's clarified that. Thank you very much, <laughs> Annabel. Yes, thank you. Morning. Um, yeah, just picking up on that uh, in that line of questioning. Um, I mean, you know, the money goes to core council services, so it's always been a bit odd to contemplate that that money is not seen as money that local government has to spend because it is. It's on their core services, so it may be that if you're saying that obviously one wouldn't want to double count money, but it perhaps a reflection might be. Uh, considered as to how you badge that money because it clearly is going to local authorities. So for the general public, it, it, it creates a bit of a misleading environment, not in terms of your uh, role, but just generally um, when that money is going to core local government services and it's not actually counted as such. By that money, I assume you're saying the 375 yeah. million money. Um, well, well uh, as, as I say, it... It, it comes through the NHS and it's accounted for in the NHS, so it's difficult um, to, to classify it as anything other than NHS money with, without double counting it. Um, wh where it's used, again, it comes down to how, how do you view the IJB. Um, I think over the last year or two in practice, much of the money has, has been used to supplement social services, but whether that would happen in future or not, I don't know. I mean, Fraser, you might want to. Can, you know, thank you. I mean, I think the, um, the first thing I would say is that, that we, we do go into a lot more detail on this topic in the financial overview report that we, we publish every year as well. And in there, we do set out in the way that Spice and others have all the different kind of categories of money um, so that it's so it's at least kind of visible convener. I think we've had lots of conversation over the years about the transparency and clarity of local government finances when... And, you know, you would think it would be a reasonably easy question to answer. Has it gone up or down? Um, but actually, it isn't because it depends on how you on how you define all of that. So what we try and do is break out all the individual bits in relation to the integration money. I think I think there is an interesting question um, that uh, Ms. Ewing just raised there about the extent to which it is local government services or not, because in theory that money is supposed to lose its identity once it goes into the integration. Arena. So some of that money might actually be being spe spent on occupational health therapists or other primary care services, not necessarily traditional social care services. So, so I don't think we can just say that all of that money is, is therefore going into local government services. The whole idea is that it loses its identity once it's in that integration uh, space. But there's no doubt that we will continue, and, and the feedback from the committee is always helpful, we will continue to try and make it as clear as we possibly can, recognising that there's only so much we can do, and then different stakeholders in this arena will want to present the money in different ways. And I think that's something that we're, we're all just going to have to live with to some extent. Um, so, so we'll continue to work at that. Um, and, and I think the important thing for us is, is as best we can, identifying the different elements of it. Can I just um, <clears throat> pick you up on that, that, that question of the IGB? Because... Is there not a, a concern around transparency with IGBs? Uh, I mean, my understanding is there's a make-up, isn't there? There's is a 72% comes for health and 28% comes for local government. So, firstly, there's a make-up of who puts in what money. Um, councillors will often tell me mm -hmm. that they feel they don't know what money's coming into the IGB, the transparency around it's difficult. The Health Secretary has stated in, a, in an answer in, in Parliament here that health boards tell her local authorities are not putting in the resources that they need to put in. So it hardly makes for you know, the, the kind of approach the kind of transparency that we would want in terms of our health and social care or primary primary health care services is there an issue there because is, is are you satisfied that the whole thing's transparent uh, well uh, clearly I, IJBs um, are a, a, a major area of interest for for us and we published a, a report at the end of last year on IGBs the second in in a series of three reports, and, and there were a number of important messages there, particularly around 
leadership in finance and uh, ask Claire to maybe expand on that. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> yes, the, we published a report on health and social care integration in November um, 2018. And in that report, we said it is not easy to set out the overall financial position of integration authorities um, for several reasons. Uh, in part, it's due to um, additional money coming in uh, later from the parties involved in integration. Um, and the use of that additional money and reserves um, to get to a final year-end position. So we did find it difficult uh, to be clear about the money that is going in to um, integration authorities. And we make the point in that report that it does make it very difficult for the public and indeed those working um, in the integrated environment to understand the underlying financial position. And then, of course, to use that information to make some of the decisions that need to be made to get towards a more integrated health and social care system. And do you have any plans to follow up on that? Because surely there comes a point where if those who are, are supposed to be uh, ensuring the financial probity and accountability of these services are saying themselves that they're unable to do that, surely there comes a point where government has got to look again? So in terms of our work in three main areas. Um, firstly, uh, we have published a previous report on health and social care integration. We knew this was too big and too long-term a policy um, initiative to try and do in one report. So we have looked at it in three major national reports, one of which was published just after the Act was passed. This second one was looking at the where are we now question. Um, and we plan to do another piece of work much further into our five-year programme, which starts to look much more deeply at what difference any of this made um, for the public in Scotland. Um, so that's one way that we're starting to tackle some of those issues. Um, the second way, I guess, is through um, the annual audit process. So we have um, accountants in all of those IJBs and, of course, in the partner bodies, the NHS boards and local authorities. Um, so they will work regularly with those with those officials to make sure that the information is clear and transparent as possible. Um, and thirdly, and, and perhaps slightly less visible, is our engagement with the senior finance leaders across all of those bodies involved. Um, so we will go along, we go, we're going along actually next week, I believe, um, to do a presentation to those members, to the senior finance officers, to talk about our concerns around issues just such as this, to help to try and move that agenda forward. So yes, it's a, it's a big issue for us. OK, thank you. That's, that's helpful. Can I move on to, you mentioned there about local authorities um, looking at fees and charges and starting to look at other ways of doing that. Um, perhaps you could say a bit more about that, but can, can, you, can you advise, do you look at the impact that, that, that fees and charges can have. And if you have an overall strategic plan, so, so one that springs to mind is that we've seen quite a number of authorities now start to charge for the green bins. But the green bins and, and collecting and, and, and reducing landfill, so there will be, the green bins will be part of a wider strategy to reduce landfill, um, to ensure that we get more recycling. And as part of the wider climate emergency, do you look at the impact of, say, the, the introducing the charges there on fly to them? It might end up costing the council more. Uh, another area is, is funeral charges, where we see funeral poverty. So are you seeing a lot more of these charges? And do you look at whether councils actually are doing impact assessment on these charges? Well, I'll, I'll maybe ask, ask Fraser to come in on, on what we do in, in terms of, the, of uh, looking at individual councils. Um, in more general terms, uh, yes, we, we make the point that when councils look at charges, it has to be um, consistent with their overall priorities and it has to take account of all the, the effects of charges. Uh, and um, you mentioned funeral charges there, and, uh, and we quoted that as an example in, in both this and indeed uh, in the financial overview. And, uh, and I know it's uh, picked up a, a, a deal of attention. Um, I, I, th I think what I said um, in December was that as councils look at different ways to raise income, clearly they're going to review their fees and charges, and it's it's very uh, it's a very uneven starting position. So you you would expect councils to be looking at what their peers charge for and at what levels, and and over time there to be an evening out in that. And I think that 
in the case of funeral charges in particular, that's a market that clearly has problems. In the private sector, um, costs have been increasing year on year at, at a very high rate, which is why the um, Competition and Markets Authority ha it has launched a, a market investigation into that. And in that context, it, it may well be that um, uh, looking around um, council charges were actually quite low in comparison to others, which do doesn't mean um, that, that there was, it's necessarily a good thing to, to raise them. But nevertheless, I think it's a mark that, that that is a a particular situation where the market is being investigated in any event. But, but in terms of um, councils and how we look at them individually on fees and charges, Fraser. Yeah, thanks, Chair. So um, I guess the first thing to say is we actually, the Commission produced us a report specifically on this topic a few years ago now, um, which was one of the How Councils Work series of reports that the Commission does, which was specifically setting out what our expectations are of councils when setting fees and charges. And, and it says exactly what you've just said, Mr Rowley. It, it would expect councils to understand the impact of uh, their fee regime to do it as part of a strategy. And I think it is fair to say that that is still very patchy. Um, I think what we can see, and we reported on it, as, as the Chair said um, in the financial overview, that um, there are there is an increasing pattern of fees and charges going up. Um, and I think it is difficult to see sometimes how that forms part of a strategy. Um, what you will see very often is councils saying, well, we're lower than the national average, so we'll increase it to the national average um, without necessarily a full understanding of what the wider impact would be. It's fair to say that we don't really have the resources to, to audit every instance of that um, across the country. That would be a, a huge task. Um, but what we can do is, 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 as we do in these reports and through other bits of work, is remind councils of our expectation to be doing exactly the kinds of things you've just described. Um, I think it's also fair to say that this debate is moving into what, what in the jargon people would, would call commercialisation. So not just raising fees and charges for things, but councils actually becoming more commercial in their operations as they're thinking about how they raise income. We've seen some uh, fairly hair-raising examples of that south of the border, I think it's fair to say, with very small district councils um, borrowing large sums of money to buy shopping centres miles away from their own area. Thankfully, we don't see any of that in Scotland, and I think that, and I think that is unlikely actually um, at the moment. Um, but that's something um, as a as a kind of future trend that we'll be keeping a very close eye on. Okay. And talking about trends, can I raise with you? We 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 keep hearing these these projections of of the demographic change that that is taking place. And if you look at those projections, then the pressure on IGBs, the pressure on, on local authority services is just going to increase and increase. Uh, so in a whole range of areas that you touch on workforce planning, but generally, I mean, what is the impact going to be? And will we need substantial uh, increases in finances going into public services if we have to meet the demographic challenges? Well, I, I think the position we've set out at the moment is that undoubtedly there is a squeeze of pressure on finances and at the same time increasing demand uh, with demographic change being, being a major factor in that. So, so that's absolutely correct. And, and the, 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 the sort of direction of travel is for that, that squeeze to continue and therefore to put increasing pressure on councils. And, that, and that's why... We, we make the point very strongly that um, transformational change is, is required to, to meet those pressures, which means w working more with partners, looking at different ways of doing things to, to be able to cope with that pressure. Um, I would say uh, at the moment, um, we, from what we see across the board, um, councils have maintained uh, services well in, in the circumstances w with a lot of efficiency savings uh, and a, that there are instances of, of good um, transformational change, but, but we do say more needs to be done, and those that haven't been performing as well need to, to sort of up the game to, to those um, that, 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 that are sort of leading it. Um, now, clearly, one can't keep on doing that forever. Um, at some point, that, that stops, but, but, but where, where we are at the moment is uh, we, we see that that, that can continue. Um, but I would make the, the caveat that we are talking about local government as a whole, and clearly uh, individual uh, councils have their own circumstances, and there are councils that are better placed than the sort of average position, and there are also councils that are 
uh, more challenge than the average position. But this transformational change, it's, if I'm sitting in a council and I'm a home carer or, or I'm a refuse collector or whatever, what does transformational change mean? Do you not reach a point where you have to be honest and say we simply cannot continue to deliver this wide range of services and we're going to have to prioritise? Or have an honest discussion with the public and say we, we need further funds to be able to pay for these increasing demands? Well, well clearly, if funding continues to be um, under pressure and demand continues to increase, year on year, you will get to a position where that happens. But, but as I say, at the moment, we're saying we over the piece, we do think there is uh, room for further transformational change. And by transformational change, I mean, as I think I said um, in, in December, forgetting about how you um, do things historically and looking at the outcomes you're trying to deliver, um, talking to your communities and your staff, and thinking of new ways of, of doing things that are both more efficient and effective. Um, and we can say a bit more about transformational change if, if that's helpful. It would be, uh, yeah. Claire, do you want to? Particularly in terms of um, the integration agenda, um, again, our report um, at the end of last year showed um, that the scale of transformation envisaged is enormous. Um, so integration authorities are trying to deal with some entrenched issues across health and um, social care services. So we recognise it will take time, um, but we highlight in that report that progress has been patchy. Um, so the transformation is actually starting to look again at the better data that is available uh, now than it has been in the past and start to think about how services need to be framed much more fully around people who need support and care um, rather than services being designed around the services themselves, if you like, so that sense of putting people at the heart of it. Um, so what we've seen happen in some areas across Scotland are some of those difficult decisions being made. Um, better engagement is variable uh, with communities um, around some services that are no longer fit for purpose. Um, to try and bring in services that better meet people's needs in a more local place. Um, so that sense of people being referred out of hospital more quickly when they're ready to go home and making sure that those good social care services with support from the third sector are in place to help support people back in their own homes as quickly as possible. And what, what we've seen over the years is um, a real commitment and sign up to that as the right thing to do. Um, of course, it's much harder when it starts to really make changes to the way people work on, on a local level. Um, so we highlight in that report some barriers that have got in the way of that um, big system transformation. And some of those relate to not um, being good enough at longer term financial planning. Um, it absolutely is relevant here. The need to look at scenario planning and be much more future focused than organisations have been in the past, which absolutely speaks to the point here about use of resources, um, limited as, the, as they can be in future, for sure. Because I mean, I'll just going to finish on this, um, but for what I can see in terms of health and social care, I looked recently at five, the number of 15 minute visits has massively increased. You, you may say, well, if the person only needs 15 minutes. Um, the numbers of uh, social carers providing care through agencies has increased. Um, so that's cheaper. The terms and conditions are much poorer. You know, is, is, is transformation more than just the workforce lose now? And what you end up then, difficulties recruiting, and you end up with a lower skilled workforce? Absolutely. This is, um, for our interest in this, this is absolutely about how money is used to achieve the right outcomes for people. And we say in this report, what we want to see is a much clearer connection between how money is being used and what it delivers and what the outcomes are for people. Um, we've reported on um, some of the, the issues around social care services over a number of years. We've plans to do more work in that area and we're looking at social care sustainability in the future. Um, um, we have talked at length in previous reports about some of the issues you've just set out, um, about how it's not absolutely about price in terms of those contracts, it's about delivering the right outcomes for people. So it continues to be a big area of interest for us. Okay, thank you. Andy? 
Um, I'd just like to ask three questions, one on um, financial planning, one on ring fencing and one on frameworks, just to give you a, a heads up. So in your report, um, you talk about um, the fact that councils are <clears throat> generally have generally made good progress with medium term financial planning, but um, less than half have significant uh, long term plans. And of those, only five are considering the impact of population and demand. Uh, change. <clears throat> Obviously, the longer you, you plan into the future, the less, the more difficult it be becomes within an uncertain environment. But do you, uh, you, you, you think it's important that there is long-term financial planning undertaken? I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit more about what that looks like. I, I, I understand what medium-term financial planning looks like because you're looking into a, a future that is broadly predictable. But what does long-term involve? And can you give any examples or maybe provide to the committee any examples um, that we could look at that represent good practice in that area? Well, I'll, I'll ask Fraser to, to deal with some specifics in that. But I'll give a little bit of context. Um, not many years ago, planning tended to be one year, and in much of the public sector, that was the same position. And, and we pushed over uh, the last several years for medium term financial planning, and now I think we've pretty much achieved that, nearly all councils do that, and, and now we're pressing for long term because it's precisely this, this long term squeeze of, of financial pressure and, and increasing demand, particularly through demographics, that, that councils need to think about and they need to think about the shape of the, the workforce and, and the way they're doing things, and that requires long term planning. And, and how are their specific changes going to affect them rather than just, well, if you increase a, um, income by 5%, what does it look like if you decrease it by 5%, which, which, which is a scenario planning of a sort. But um, Fraser, do you want to say more on that? Yeah, just to build on that, Chair, so, uh, so when we talk about long term, we talk about up to 10 years in this context is what we have in mind, so kind of 5 to 10 years, and I absolutely agree, Mr Whiteman, that that is not easy, it's, it, it, it becomes definitely more of an art than a science, but we still think it's important, and in a sense we would argue that because of the uncertainty and complexity, it's even more important rather than rather than less that a council or, or indeed any uh, large organisation has a sense of where it's headed, recognising that that needs to be updated. I think, as the chair mentioned there, I think quite a lot of councils now can do the kind of input side. So, if if our budget is zero percent, two percent, five percent, ten percent cuts, we can we can measure that. The bit that's less uh, clear to us is the extent to which the demand side is actually factored into those plans. So what is going to happen to demographics in our area? What will that mean for services? And I think importantly for us, having some sense of what changes the council and their partners are making in terms of service delivery, the transformation point, will then actually make to demand. I think sometimes we find that councils and some public bodies are a bit accepting of the demographics and demand as a given. It's part of the context. Actually, part of their job has to be about influencing that demand, shaping that demand, reducing the demand. So it's that kind of sophistication that we're, that we're looking to, to push at in the context, as the Chair said, of, of councils having made really good progress over the last few years in medium term uh, planning. In terms of specific examples, I'm very happy to write to the committee with some of those. We've picked up some through our best value assurance reporting. Um, so very happy to, to follow that up for the committee. OK, that would be very helpful. Um, moving on to, to ring fencing, you talk about this um, uh, in your report, um, I think in Exhibit 3, pages 16 and, and 17. Um, so you talk about the increase from 6.6% of ring fenced money to 12%. Um, we, this is an issue we picked up in our budget scrutiny and we asked the Scottish Government and COSLA uh, for greater clarity on their view on this uh, point. The Scottish Government told us it was up to councils to determine how to achieve policy initiatives, but COSLA <coughs> came forward with a figure of 60% of what they call protection. Uh, um, you've probably seen the letter from COSLA, but they talk about hidden uh, ring fencing. Um, I mean, we raised this because um, we'd like a bit more transparency next year's budget about the question of flex, never mind where money comes from and how much money is going on, but, but the question of flexibility, because this is going to become important, both in terms of medium and long term financial planning. If you've got things you want to do, and yet, even though the, you might be getting more money to do it, your, your flexibility to do that is constrained, that will have an impact on that. So we think it's quite important to get a, a good handle on this. Um, so do you think the difference between your 12% and COSLA's 
is relatively easily explicable, but do you think it's legitimate to talk about hidden ring fencing or is there other language you can use? Um, I'll, I'll ask Ashley to come in and, and maybe some of the detail of that. Um, I, I think in general, um, uh, we, we have taken a slightly different approach from COSLA. Um, clearly, if you're looking at discretionary spend in a year, um, you, you want to know well, what can I change. Um, now, the approach we, we've taken here and set out is, is um, t taking out that element that's sort of external to councils, as it were. It's, it's either specifically ring-fenced by government or indirectly ring-fenced in that they, they've got to do certain things to, or, or they don't get the money. Um, I think COSLA's approach has been more take out the sort of fixed costs and, and see what's left in terms of what's flexible in the year. And for example, they would take out um, the loan servicing as, as a fixed cost. Whereas from our point of view, we'd say, well, that ultimately is a council decision. Yes, it's a legacy of a previous decision, but it's still a council decision. So, so we are looking at the element that's sort of external to councils, and I think COSLA uh, are more focusing on, on what's actually flexible in the year. But Ashley can give you a bit yeah, more information. That's, that's just about it. The difference between COSLA's numbers and ours is um, the loan charges, um, and COSLA take into account the increase in demand, especially in health and social care, which we've discussed and we're, we're very aware of. But we don't feel that that fits within the calculations that we're setting out here, which are much more based on uh, what's set out in the circulars and in the Scottish budget. I think you also do mention things like education, where there's a pupil-teacher ratio set nationally. So that is what they regard as hidden ring fencing too. Yeah. Um, so we've actually just had a meeting with Costler and we're understanding the two different ways uh, that, we're, that we're working. And going forward, we're going to carry on having those conversations. Um, we've taken things that are set out very clearly, either in the circulars in the, the bits at the front or within the budget documents that come from other portfolios. Things like the teacher numbers uh, were set out in the circulars, but earlier than uh, the current ones. So we haven't included them because we don't have the clarity on um, what else might be included, because we know about the teacher numbers, but there, there are a long list of things that we, we maybe don't know about. And so don't have that clarity to include uh, in our, our exhibit here, um, which we're trying to just keep clear. And we're just covering the last two years. No, that's very helpful. And I think um, the committee has in the past um, welcomed the work that the Council Commission and SPICE and the government have done to share. And, and if we could do a little bit more work in the coming year on that, that would be extremely um, helpful. I just want to move on now to my final line of questioning around kind of frameworks. And I was interested to look at the performance, part three of your report. Um, exhibit six took me a little bit of time to get my head around because some of the red ones were positive percentages and some were negative and the green ones, some of them were, but then, then I got my head around it. So <laughs> basically it's green's good and red's bad, um, or green's improving performance uh, and, 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 and uh, red is not. Um, I mean, how you, I mean, this is, this is a line that COSLA gave us as well, that they're expect, they're delivering, I don't know, I think they said something around 60% of the national performance framework outcomes. and they don't feel that they have as much control over uh, their ability to do that as they might. Yeah. Um, we also then have the local government benchmarking um, framework. Um, and although, you know, exhibit six and seven, I think are useful to an extent, there's potential for confusion about measuring far too many things. Is there any scope for kind of rationalizing this or would that be inappropriate in the sense that one is very explicitly um, Scotland's outcomes and the other is very much local government performance. So maybe they have to stay separate. Well, I, I, I think the, the two approaches are fulfilling two, two different purposes, as, as you um, suggested. And the, the LGBF is, is national, but it's national in, in the sense that it's, it's looking at individual authorities across the nation. And, and the value of that, um, specifically for local authorities, is, is the benchmarking. So they can see where they um, rank in relation to other councils that are similar to them in a number of respects. Um, and, and one of the features of the LGBF structure is that they, they have um, put councils into family groups where councils themselves have said, yes, um, there's comparability here. Now, clearly, there isn't going to be comparability across every service. And, and I think it's worth saying, in, in, in fact, in relation to both sets of numbers, 
when you look at um, any of these uh, national da data sources, the, the, the comparisons you draw almost always raise questions rather than provide answers. And I think that's very much the case with, with LGBF, and, and we, we find it useful. We, we um, re reduced uh, dramatically the number of uh, um, statutory performance indicators we, we required councils to, to, to publish to give space for the LGBF information to go in. And we, and we do think it is, is useful and, and we use it, but we use it as, as part of looking at a council in the round. And, and it raises questions that we then look at from other perspectives. So I think it, that, that purpose is quite different from the national performance um, purpose. I mean, clearly there should be coherence between the two, but that doesn't mean you can necessarily mer merge the databases and. And if you look at the national performance framework, for example, I, I don't think you can break down some of the measures there to, to um, individual local government levels. So, so you, you couldn't merge them in that sense anyway. My follow-up question, you talk about in paragraph 100 about <coughs> many of the national performance framework indicators are not available at the local level, but the improvement services developed a community planning outcomes profile tool. Uh, I confess I haven't had time to go and have a, a look at that. But there is, is there work underway to try and break down the national performance outcomes um, at a local level, where, where appropriate. I mean, some of them will not be appropriate. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you, convener. That, that's actually the point I was hoping to come in on, Mr Whiteman. So, so there is some work around that. The community planning outcomes profile has actually been a thing that's been in development for some time, um, and that was designed really for community planning partnerships to get data on on outcomes uh, in, in local areas. I think there is an interesting debate, given that the National Performance Framework was jointly launched last year by COSLA and Scottish Government. It's not just a Scottish Government-owned thing anymore. There is a question for, for local government and subsequently for us about how, if and how we would expect councils to be able to report on their contribution to the National Performance Framework. So all central government bodies are required to be able to show that. Um, as part of the, their, their own reporting uh, and performance management arrangements. So you should be able to draw a line from the national outcomes through to the contribution of individual agencies. There is an interesting question, therefore, about what we would expect councils to be able to do, given that their interest clearly is local and not national. So I do think, I do think that's a kind of work in progress. The improvement service are, are working with, with others in thinking about that. Um, and certainly from our perspective, that will be... I think part of our development as we continue to look at how <laughs> councils are are reporting their performance to their to their communities. So, can you put a time scale on that? That the, the work that's underway to clarify but local government's role. Is the short in... answer, I'm afraid, no. Okay, but work's underway to yeah. try and. Okay, it's clearly important. And I was just saying, as I'm sure you know, that the, the obligation on councils is to have regard to the, the NPF, and, and and I think that that phrase was carefully chosen to recognise. Uh, the differences in, in localities, and, and as Fraser said, um, this has just started, so it will take some time to, to find out how that's going to work and how we can use it and monitor it. Okay, and just finally, there was a, an agreement on the, the budget this year that the government would um, work to introduce a fiscal framework between Scottish Government and local authorities. Are you involved in those discussions or anticipate being involved in those discussions? Uh, we haven't been to date, but as ever, we'd be delighted to uh, to be involved in, in a, an appropriate way. Certainly, I think we can um, bring you know to bear our experience of of this kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, for um, cause and government to work out the detail of that, but we'd be more than happy to engage in that discussion. So I'll take that away. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Good. Okay. Thank you, Annabelle. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. Just could we go back because I, I didn't manage to get my wee sup in at the time. Just to go back to the uh, discussion we were having. Um, about the uh, the badging of, of monies and how that appears in terms of the local government's overall budget. Um, I, I had understood, having referenced to previous committee documents, I'm a relatively new member of this committee, but in previous discussions of the committee, that in fact there might be other monies, other grant monies aside from the IGB that doesn't make the cut as far as badging as local government money in terms of the look back at the last years. Is that correct? So is there money apart from the IGB money that doesn't make the cut as being included as local government spent, even though there's grants that go to local government? Mm, I'm so actually, not aware of anything. No. There's no other money at all? No, I mean, the, the, so the big... So in this version, I've also got um, last year's report as well, 
uh, which has the revenue grant, non-domestic rates, the specific revenue grants, and then in the previous version, we had a separate line for health and social care funding via the NHS, which the chair said earlier was 357. So, no, that's, that's it in its entirety. I think. Over the last six years, there's no other money that's not... Um, there, there, well, we, we had to change how we measured this when police and fire came out of local government and became national bodies, but, but that's something that we agreed okay. with Spice and others some time ago. So, no, apart from that, it's a it's a like-for-like like measure. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question, I think it, a, a reference was made to where we are with this budgetary year, and I had understood that the overall position in cash terms was that, in fact, the allocation from central government represented a 2.5% increase. Is that the right figure? Actually, is that in cash terms, in cash 20. terms between 2019-20 budget allocation, we say a 2.9 percent increase in cash terms between 2018-19 and 19-20 in exhibit 2.9 percent. Okay, it's just that every time you read something, there's a slightly different figure. But a 2.9 percent increase in cash terms in terms of this year's budget vis-à-vis -vis last year's budget. Uh, yeah. Exhibit two sets that out and breaks that. Sorry? Exhibit 2 sets out... Right, that. so it's 2.9%. OK, yeah, well, that's, mean, that's the, fine. The, the in-year um, comparisons are slightly complicated by the fact that £34.5 million pounds moved, um, and that, that, which is why earlier I referred to 0.4% over two years, because if, if I just talk about the last two years, then I, I don't need to worry about where £34.5 okay. million pounds in £10 billion pounds went. But if you want to start talking about specific years you actually do have to worry about it. Yeah, so if we do talk about specific years, which many people do, and make that comparison, year-on-year -year comparison, it's this year versus last year is a 2.9% increase in cash terms. Yes, and when, when right. we were here in December, um, the position from uh, 2017 to 18 to 2018-19 was an increase in, in real funding, but that was with one treatment of 34.5%. Million. When that changed, that then became a decrease in real funding, and because 2018-19 reduced, that meant it was a lower base for 2018-19 to 2019-20, which increased the amount of the increase from 2018-19 to 2019-20, mm -hmm. and that's exactly why I was trying to deal with two years together. Um, I, I think that clarification is uh, maybe it's left a few much. people behind, <laughs> but I think uh, in terms of what Ashley said, 2.9% increase in cash terms, I think that's a very clear position. So, um, in terms of uh, you know looking at what is uh, open to local authorities in terms of initiatives and so forth, one of course is community empowerment. And I just wonder uh, what your views might be on how that can be used as a helpful tool, in fact, for local authorities in terms of uh, asset transfer, for example, and other issues. Uh, it would be interesting to hear your reflections on, on that. Well, well I, th I think um, when one talks about community empowerment, there, there are a number of aspects to it. There, there, there's asset transfer, participatory budgeting, uh, community engagement. I, I think one area we, we, where we would um, see it being particularly pertinent, and, and we've um, emphasised this and we emphasise it in the individual best value reports on, on councils, is, is that when we talk about transformational change, that um, involves... Uh, uh, as a fundamental part of it, talking to communities about how best to deliver outcomes for those communities and also taking the community not as, a, as an object that you, you do things to or provide services to, but, but an active participant that, that, that may actually be involved in, in doing things itself. And, and I think that's one specific area where uh, community empowerment links up with transformational change in, in, in a very constructive way. And, and that's that's certainly one aspect we, we um, highlight. Yeah, yeah, we, we see this as a really important area of development. So uh, it's complicated to audit. There's no doubt about it. Um, so we have set up a community empowerment advisory group, which brings together um, scrutiny bodies interested in local authorities um, and experts from the sector. It's been really, really interesting being part of that work. It's made us think quite deeply about how to look at what good looks like, because on the face of it, some things may appear to be quite good. Uh, when actually you get underneath the skin of it, it's, it's not quite as authentic as it should be. Um, and I'm going to really oversimplify this very complicated area, but I think one of the things we're, we're coming to see is that those areas that do it very well 
have it in their bones. It's part of what everybody does. So they don't have special little teams that tick the box around community empowerment. They see it as integral to how they run the business essentially. Um, so engaging well with local communities, looking for opportunities to work collaboratively with communities is just part of what they do. So it's no doubt it's early days for local authorities, um, but we see some signs of real interest in progress. Um, and for us, it's, it's, it's a learning exercise as well, I think. So we will want to reflect on that and think about what that means for our future audit work. But it is a, it's a big area. It's a big change in area for us to keep an eye on, I think. I think I think that's absolutely the case. I think it provides an opportunity. So I think it's quite an exciting uh, uh, area of activity for local authorities. And just picking up the point that you made there, Claire, um, I, I wondered then, it, it, you know, the very important point you made about, uh, it, to paraphrase you, hopefully not incorrectly, that you know the, the the ones that are doing best are the ones that it's a whole council approach rather than treating it as some little sort of silo somewhere. And I wonder, is COSLA kind of on that? Are they? looking at ways to ensure best practice is shared because it is it's in its infancy and it's really important that you know uh, for those that are doing it really well that they share their their approach with the hope that we and see that uh, roll out across Scotland in that in that way yes um, we're speaking to Cosler about this very issue um, and it, it is it's absolutely right that whilst you can't have a one-size fits all approach people are starting from different places there's much to be learnt um, particularly from those areas that are that little bit further ahead um, one of the key things we'll, we look for is to what extent those relationships are well established so again back to health and social care integration we saw much better engagement with communities where that had been an agenda for a long time um, we know that some areas are coming to this a little bit newer so they've got much more work to do so yes there's absolutely an agenda there about sharing what works um, but a real appetite for that to happen i think we see that uh, that's encouraging. Uh, one last area of activity uh, that, of questioning, uh, convener, if I may. Um, so looking at issues to do with, for example, uh, gender pay gap uh, and how councils are addressing that. And I would add in that, that I think there's still some outstanding equal pay claims uh, and how that has been dealt with. So uh, I don't know who would like to do that. To see what we're in the audits. Uh, yes, in fact, we are, because we, we spoke about this last time we were uh -huh. here, I seem to remember, um, particularly around the equal pay and, and, and uh, the pension element of that. So we are in the process of doing our what, what we call our impact reports. That follows up on the equal pay report we did last year, which will allow us to, to look at how progress is, is being made. And the gender pay gap, um, while that wasn't the focus of our last bit of work increasingly, I think we need to turn our attention to that. Um, at, at the moment, um, I mean, obviously, there's the Glasgow Equal Pay situation, which which has which has been resolved up to a point, but they, they, they you know they still need to pay out um, to to the women who are affected by that, and that's something obviously that we'll be uh, reporting on as part of this year's local audit in Glasgow. Uh, so that report will come to me in September uh, about progress on that specific issue. Um, I think in most other places at the moment, equal pay um, is is reasonably settled, but as you know. Over the years, it, it is um, highly affected by case law, so it can, you know, all it can take is another um, case to be settled somewhere, and that can kickstart a whole series of other things. So we continue to keep an eye on it, and, and certainly once our impact reports are, are available and we've done that, we'll, we'll be delighted to share that with the committee. Um, thank you. Um, it, so you mentioned Glasgow, and obviously, you know, payments have to be paid, but a deal has been reached, which I think was really a, a very, very encouraging. Uh, development uh, for all the those affected um, in the city. Um, uh, which councils are still? Do, do, are there any councils then that still have outstanding claims that have not reached uh, a deal with the workers' consent? So, so I'll come back to confirm. But no, I think all councils now have settled okay. um, equal pay. There might be some individual claims okay. because that can happen at any sure. point. But no, in terms of of agreeing. Uh, deals uh, with, with the workforce, um, all councils have now settled. But I'll double check that and confirm That'd it That would be helpful. You. And lastly, just on the gender pay gap, so going forward in the future, I, I take it then we can say with some confidence that uh, this will not be an issue then uh, for Well, you're a, you're a braver person than I to say, to say mm -hmm. it won't be an issue. Um, I think that 
that's oh, unlikely. Just, I mean, yeah. I think... I, I it's just 2019. The, one would hope that eventually, you know, women might get the same yeah, yeah, Yes, you, know? you would. Uh, yes, yeah. you would. And, and I think one, you know, at least there's a step in the right direction in that we are getting increasing clarity and transparency around what the gender pay gap is, which I think has to be a good thing. Um, but it does seem to me that we are still uh, a long way to go until we're in that place. Um, but, uh, but that's why I think it's important that councils and all bodies are reporting on it and taking, taking steps to make sure that there is equal pay. And, and I think, as, as Fraser mentioned, that the, 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 the structure of, of the, the framework is such that um, even though you've agreed a deal and it's all been signed off, uh, it, it doesn't mean that, that it's impossible for that to be opened up again, uh, unless and until I think it's time expired, as far, as far as I know, in terms of making an appeal. So if case law changes and someone takes up the point, you can, it, it is possible to open up some things. Uh, oh, I understand agreed. that from a legal yeah. perspective, but uh, I mean, going forward for on gender pay, I mean, one would hope that we're moving to an I end will. game now that we all get paid the same for the same, same work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that cheery comment. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very, very quickly, um, it was just to follow up on the, the community empowerment uh, issue that Annabelle Ewing was asking about. And, and Claire Sweeney, you said that some councils were, were basically doing it better than others, and some had been doing it for a long time. Are, are you able to tell us, you know, who's who's leading, who's out there? So we've got some case studies in the report that set right. out some examples where we see um, more progressive practice, you might say, but it is variable. Um, um, so the case study, for example, on page 28, uh, which sets out um, of the progress that's been made in East Ayrshire Council uh, around the vibrant communities approach would be an example we would use. Um, but again, places are changing very quickly, so we expect others to start to catch up around some of those um, initiatives, but that's an example we would refer to. And, and I would say in, in terms of sharing good practice, um, councils do look at best value reports and they look at other councils' best value reports. And, 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 I, and I know from speaking to councils that when we... Uh, put out the East Ayrshire Best Value Report, and, and we said that, that, that they were doing well on community empowerment. Uh, many councils looked that up to see what they were doing, and their model won't fit everyone, but uh, councils do look at what other people are doing and take notice of it. Thank you. Uh, Alexander, Nick. Thanks, convener. We've already touched this morning on the difficulties that councils are facing with workforce planning. And having the right staff in the right place with the right skills and right leadership is vitally important for uh, the progress uh, that we've seen, uh, ensuring that they can maintain and retain some of the services that they have. But you've touched on the ageing population uh, within the workforce uh, and the retention uh, and the recruitment issues that they have. So how are councils managing to square that circle to ensure that they do have uh, the personnel who have the right skills uh, to, to take the uh, organisation forward over the next uh, three, five, ten years uh, when they have so many critical demands on budget and financial constraints to manage? Um, I, I think we make um, two, two points uh, about this in, in the report. And, and the first is that the workforce planning across the piece is inconsistent. Yeah. And, and we emphasise in this report, and, and we make the point in individual best value reports on councils, that it's really important to have an integrated, organisation-wide workforce plans. I mean, some councils, some very well-run councils, have workforce plans, but they're they're service um, workforce plans. And and if you're going to undertake transformation and look to the future and how things are changing, you really need to look at the workforce across the piece. And we have highlighted um, some councils there where there's been good practice. South Lanarkshire, a, a couple of months ago, has. Um, uh, organisation-wide workforce planning at, at, at the heart of, of what it does and, and we mentioned I, th I think in the Glasgow Best Value Report um, they, they have retraining so people can move from, from one area to another as, as part of their workforce planning and, and I think workforce planning is, is really one of the big, big issues. We talk about financial pressure and transformational change. I think, I think workforce is, is alongside those as being absolutely key. Mm -hmm. the, the second issue we, we refer to in terms of workforce is that um, there is no national database of, sort of skill sets uh, across councils to identify where there are areas where mm -hmm. there's just a dearth of 
skills across the board and and uh, in a number of situations that that would be a, a useful thing to, to to have i don't know if you want to add the, anything. the only thing i would add to your thank you is that some of these issues can be very place specific um, so if I think about the experience in Highland recently, not only were the council looking for a new chief executive and other senior managers, so was the health board at exactly the same time. And there is just something about the capacity of, yeah. of, of us being able to recruit to these very big and important senior jobs in places like Inverness and, and, yeah. and Highland. Um, at the same time, and that is a real challenge in some parts of, of, of Scotland. So, as well as the national picture that Graham's just described, um, there are some particular hotspots that are that are difficult to manage. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, 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 you've identified one of the, the big concerns that they have, which is ensuring that you have the, the calibre of individual who can take on these roles and responsibilities. Uh, but we've also found that. In the report, you, you, you touch on uh, sickness absence as well across some councils and the impact that that's having uh, on, on the, the non-teaching side of that. Uh, uh, and there have been some quite variations uh, across some of the councils, uh, uh, with some doing extremely well and others really struggling uh, to manage that. Uh, and that's having an impact on, on the quality and the support and the mechanisms uh, that goes into ensuring that you have, uh, as I said, the right people doing the right job, but they need to be there to be able to do that effectively. Uh, and that seems to be a growing issue that councils are now having to manage on a month-to-month -month basis much bigger uh, than they had in the past. So views about how, how that is being resourced and how that is being supported to ensure that they can get uh, and are getting the workforce uh, uh, that they need in the locations uh, to do the jobs. Well, I, I, I think the, within this report, the, the point we've made is, is one that scrutiny bodies or, 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 or regulators, um, I think, frequently make. They, you, you can take the average or the upper quartile and, and say, well, if, if you could all achieve that, look at the impact it would have. And, and I think that is actually a, a very useful tool because it, it, it avoids issues about, well, we are not comparable with this different business type of business. It, th th this is looking at your own area and saying, well, you know, if you just do as well as other people, it's a bit of a blunt instrument, but I think in terms of encouragement and pointing out issues, it's, it's very useful. Fraser, you might want yeah, to come in. Add, I think um, the evidence that you heard, I think from Click Manager and um, East Ayrshire was, I thought, really interesting. And I think one of the points that the chief exec of Click Manager made to you was that the, the health of the communities in Click Manager is the same as the health of the people that work in the council, because they are the same people. So, um, and that will be the case in lots of places in, in Scotland. Um, and that's why I think taking a wider view sometimes of health inequalities uh, and prioritising that with partners in the NHS and the third sector and elsewhere it, it can be really very important. Um, so, there's, so there are absolutely things that the councils can do as an employer organisation, as you would expect them to do as, as good employers. And in some places, there is a wider picture to this as well that they also need to work at. And, uh, you know, and that comes down to the, we've touched on transformational change, about the culture, uh, about the, the effectiveness within communities. Uh, so what are the supports that are available uh, to councils in developing that transformational change to ensure that they can address the cultural change and the needs within the community? Yeah, yeah I'm happy to that. pick that up. So um, the Improvement Service actually are currently doing a, a specific piece of work around transformation. So they're developing, I forget if it's going to be called a toolkit or an approach or something, but they're, but they're doing some work to learn uh, the lessons from transformation programmes across councils and to pull that together in a, in a kind of handy guide, if you like. And as well as that, the Improvement Service have been quite proactive in working with individual councils to actually get people into the councils to work. So Click Manager is an example where um, the Improvement Service have helped them recruit a change manager, um, somebody who's been brought in specifically to help the change process. And I know that some other councils have done that too. Um, and again, this is an area in which uh, I think you know we can certainly help through our best value audit reports, and as the chair's already said, we do think they get they get well and widely read, um, uh, and I think it's an area that we will continue to to work with improvement service and others to see what what more we can do to help share good practice when we find it. And, and, and clearly, it's a it's a greater challenge for smaller councils, um, where they they will need to look outside for help, unlike the larger councils that may be able to put together a team of quite a few people to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes. Good morning, panel. A really fascinating report, uh, as always. Um, in, in paragraph 64, you say, and I quote, councils in England have experienced very significant reductions in funding. Funding to local government has fallen by 49% between 2010-11 and 2018 and have used several commercial approaches to support their finances in response. Now, earlier you said that SIP was concerned by the level of borrowing by councils uh, who have went down this road, and you talked about shopping malls. In fact, my own council narrowly voted 17 votes to 16 against spending £72 million buying a 47-year-old shopping centre. I'm delighted to say that didn't go through. But what c should local authorities consider when trying to develop commercial services? Because clearly there must be some positive aspects to what's happening in terms of that area down south. Well, I, I mean, I, I think the first point is it, it is a decision for the council <coughs> to assess mm -hmm. And they need to, to look at, at, at the risks and advantages. I would say from, from my point of view, if, if you're a council, you're, you're set up in a completely different way from a, a commercial business. So if you're venturing into to a, a commercial market, competing with other businesses, you need to have, have a very good reason for doing that in a basis. And you need to to be able to say, well, what is my sustainable competitive advantage there? I mean, there's no point in saying, well, fashion's hot, let's go into fashion as a business. You, you either need to be, exp I would say, exploiting um, existing skills or services that you, you, you provide and can be used or, or redeployed in, in a commercial way or, or assets that you have that, that, that have a, a commercial use rather than just going into um, commercial activity for its own sake on the basis it's a good thing. Um, but then you come down to, well, why are we doing it? What are the risks? Uh, and that is that that is a decision for the council and they should go through a, a careful process of assessment. I don't know, Fraser, no, just you only to add, I think there is, there is a fair bit of um, evidence out there in the APSE, which I think stands for the Association of Public Service Excellence, um, which is a UK organisation, does a lot of work in this area. And so they're I know in regular contact with um, the Society of Local Authority Chief Execs in Scotland to, to share the experience of, of Down South. And I think, as, well, the, the examples we've just used about the shopping malls are, are an extreme version. There is a lot of stuff happening. In a, in a, in a funny way, the significant funding reductions that have, that have been experienced in England have, I think, resulted in probably a bit more innovation and, a bit, and some slightly more radical thinking about how they can generate own income that's, that's well short of those kind of really risky um, endeavours. Uh, so I know that um, councils in Scotland are often looking south of the border to see how that how that how that might work up here. Yeah, it is a mother of invention, I should say. If anyone wants any advice on, on fashion, then I'm sure Alexander would be willing to uh, provide it, given that was his, uh, his career. Um, in Exhibit 10, uh, I found it um, quite heartening that uh, Scottish uh, educational attainment has grown uh, by some 16%, improved by 16% from 2011-12 to 2017-18. But what is also what, what is concerning is that the gap between local authorities in terms of that improvement it appears to be huge. 1% in Dundee, 34% in Falkirk. And you talk about the fact that, um, you know, even if one considers, for example, um, uh, deprivation, uh, you know, uh, you say, for example, a paragraph 110, the reasons why Glasgow and Falkirk have seen big improvements in attainment in Dundee is not can't be explained simply by the amount spent on education or levels of deprivation. Um, and you, you, you talk, uh, uh, you, you expand further on this in paragraphs 111, 112. I mean, um, you know, 112, for example, Education Scotland rated Renfrewshire Council, excellent. But what you've, you've talked about is the need to share uh, best value, the Glasgow Improvement Challenge, for exam example, um, Falkirk Council's uh, good performance management, which was highlighted as far back as 2015. Are councils like Dundee and other local authorities that are not performing as well as they as they should be, despite the level of resources relative to the local authorities? Are they starting to change? Are they picking up the best um, the best methods of working of Glasgow or Falkirk or other areas? How how is how do you envisage improvements taking place in terms of this really important area? Yep, I, th I think the short answer is yes, they are. Um, we we actually mentioned that in Dundee they they. Um, they have a thing called the Attainment Challenge process and Education Scotland found that that was beginning to have inroads. Um, but in a, And I know that the Chief Exec in Dundee is, is hugely committed to the local government benchmarking framework as a tool to 
ask questions. It doesn't provide the answers as to why things are they are, but it does help ask some questions. And he's very keen to learn lessons from other places, and there's lots of evidence of them doing that. Um, and in a sense, I think that's what we're trying to demonstrate in the section, Mr Gibson, which is not for us to have the answer as to why it is, but to highlight the fact that at least a couple of the areas that you might think would inform the results don't appear to, so money and deprivation. So, so there must be something else going on there, and it is absolutely for the councils to get under the skin of that and to really understand what has worked in Falkirk or Glasgow and how might that work for us recognising that you know all local authority areas have different contexts and different needs. Um, but but I do we do see a lot of that activity uh, happening. Things like the People Equity Fund I think has been helpful because as well as the the money being spent in individual places, Education Scotland are providing a whole series of resources for councils to to identify what's worked in some places, and that's building up a really good database of what works across the country. So um, we are going to be doing. Uh, a, re a report on behalf of the Commission and the Auditor General um, next year on educational outcomes, where we are going to get an, into all of this uh, and the education reform agenda more generally. That's that's scheduled for May or June of next year. Um, so um, this is a real area of uh, of importance for us. So in a sense, what you have in here is a wee a wee taster, and we'll do the, the full education report next year. And, 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 uh, sorry, I just add one thing about the statistics you mentioned the range. If you look at Exhibit 10, there is a wide range there, um, but it is a very skewed distribution. Um, if you look at all 32 councils, and there's one or uh, possibly two councils that are, are significantly different from the others, and when you're looking at range statistics, that does spread it out quite a bit. Yeah, I would hope your report though, would, would, would explain that in, in further detail. When you, um, now in paragraph 51, um, you talk about the e school programme in Aileen Shah using technology to allow pupils to access teachers, classes or resources from any school within the council or elsewhere in Scotland. Is this something where, uh, where significant, you envisage significant improvements, the use of digital approaches to drive improvement? Well, I mean, digital is a, a, a major area that, that all councils are interested in and... Um, I have to say that they're all working together and, and sharing uh, practice. Uh, we, we attended the Solace um, conference last year and there was a, a section on digital with, with a couple of councils presenting to the others. And it, it is clearly one of the main areas that, that um, Council C has the potential to transform services. Um, in terms of the digital office, do you want to say something about the digital office? No, I think I mean I think the digital office for local government has been a really good recent um, development that's been up and running now for a couple of years. Um, it's a relatively small organisation in its own right, but but it's designed to provide the networks and the connections. And I think virtually all councils have now signed up to that. Uh, I think as we go on to say on page 23 in para 52, there are some things that councils need to be aware of, particularly in the jargon digital exclusion so recognizing that not everyone is is able to or wants to engage with their local council through digital means but but i think the examples we've we've produced in 51 um and, and the glasgow one in particular i think is a great example of sometimes it's not about new technology it's not about putting in new it systems it's about actually thinking how can we better use the data we already have uh, and I know that one of the challenges that, that councils have, indeed not just councils, but many public sector organisations, is having the right skills in-house to do the data analysis, the data, you know, the data analytics type work that allows um, councils really to make the most of all the data they have. They, they are very data-rich organisations. Councils know a lot about their communities. The trick is actually being able to organise and use that data in a way that can be that can be more helpful for services. And I think that's going to, that's as well as this kind of, if you like, IT bit of it, a big part of the digital office's job is to look at data and how we better use it. Okay, well, one area of disappointment in the report was in paragraph 67, where you say, shared services, one potential approach to partnership working uh, through our audit work, we've seen only a limited number of examples of councils sharing services, and you, you, you give three examples. I mean, things like council tax collection, payroll, there must be, you know, even road repairs, there must be a lot of areas where councils can cooperate across boundary to deliver more efficiently and effectively um, their services. Can you just... Talk a wee, wee bit about that. Well, I think our, our, our approach to this is to, is to emphasise the, the partnership element. And, and councils do work in partnership with a range of bodies, including other councils, but, but also other public bodies, third sector, communities, private sector. Um, and we don't have a, a particular 
push on working with other councils specifically, and, and there may be reasons of different priorities or different administrative structures that, that make a partnership with somebody else um, uh, easier. So I, I think um, working with other councils is, is one of the elements of partnership we look at, but we wouldn't assess partnership working purely on that. We'd look at how they're working across the piece. I don't know if you've... Uh, only very briefly, convener, I'm, I'm in danger of... Um plugging the work of the Improvement Service a lot this morning, I'm, I'm <laughs> noticing, but uh, they also happen to be doing a piece of work on shared services specifically at the moment. Um, so they've just embarked on that work. I think they're, they're hoping to have something done this year, um, which looks at the examples of shared services that there have been, what some of the barriers are, how you can make it work more successfully. So I think hopefully that will be a really helpful tool for for councils. I think to recognise when, when something is right for shared services, we have seen too many examples, I think, where an awful lot of time and energy is spent trying to get a shared service up and running, and then for various reasons it doesn't happen. And it may be that if there's, you know, a better assessment right up front, once you embark on the process, you've, you know, you'll have more confidence that it is actually going to work. So hopefully that will be a helpful piece of work. Thank you. I've been dotting a, a, around a wee bit, um, uh, convener, because there's so many different things to cover, and I, th I thank you for your indulgence. I'll just touch on, I, I won't talk about EU uh, workers in paragraph 86, but uh, I will go into 121 just to finish off, if that's OK. And this is about homelessness. We've uh, we've undertaken a major um, uh, inquiry into homelessness over a period of nine months and made a lot of recommendations, picked up the Scottish Government. But I notice it, it says here that uh, the Scottish Housing Regulator reported in March 2018 that Glasgow City Council had failed to offer temporary or emergency accommodation to 40% of 5,377 applications had for assistance in 2016-17 and had also provided settled accommodation just over half of the households that are due to provide to. Now, there's obviously been a change in uh, political administration. I'm glad to see in Glasgow since then. But what, what action can be taken uh, um, when, when local authorities are not fulfilling the statutory requirements in such important areas? I think this particular area <coughs> falls under the, the scope of the housing regulator. And so the housing regulator would fo follow this up. Um, we ourselves are going to be carrying out um, some work on, on housing uh, that will report next year, and homelessness was one of the um, sort of the principal contenders for that. And, and in the end, we've actually gone for affordable housing because there is a lot of work being done in homelessness, not not least your, your own committee. And the housing regulator is, is going to do some thematic work on on um, homelessness, and they're consulting with Audit Scotland on that. So, so we are interested in, in this and we're involved in it, but, but the, the main work is at the moment is being done by others, so we're, we think we, we can get more value for our resource by, by looking at aff affordable homes f as far as housing is concerned at the moment. But we'll continue to, to monitor this, uh, and particularly in individual best value reports. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, 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 very briefly, very briefly. Can, I, can I ask a couple of quick questions? Go back, go back to Alexander's um, workforce planning and sickness levels. Is there any evidence, any correlation between the reducing numbers of staff working within local authority services? There used to be a saying that more for less, that was the buzzword for a while in local government, but the pressure that's on those that are left, so mental health, stress, in terms of sickness, is there any correlation there between reducing numbers of staff? I'm not aware of any specific work that's been done in that. Intuitively, um, clearly, if, if uh, a particular area is under a lot of pressure, that, that could well result in, in higher absenteeism. Um, and I think possibly we've all been in environments where, where we've seen that sort of thing happen. Um, but I'm not aware of any across the board work. So, so, so this, and, and I don't, I'm not sure it's been done here. I don't think there is a clear correlation, on, and I say that on the basis that pretty much every council on the land has reduced the number of people they have, and some councils manage sickness absence much better than others. Um, so there is something about the way in which it's done that's important. I think that's why we keep banging on about workforce planning, because I think where you're most likely to find those kind of scenarios is, is in specific parts of, of the council. Um, in relatively small teams, a couple of people leaving can have a disproportionate impact on the people that are left behind. And that's why it's really important that workforce planning understands the impact on the changes that people are, are making, um, not only in terms of being able to d 
deliver a service, but in terms of what the impact is on uh, on the colleagues that that are still that are still working there. So, so it is about workforce planning and about how you manage absence. I think it seems to be the difference rather than just necessarily a reduction in in numbers. Finally, this. We know that people are now told we have to work till we're 60 years old. The average age for senior officials in local government retiring must be in the 50s, have they thought? Uh, there seems to be a big gap between workers uh, on the front line and, and their resource and their pension and senior officials leaving the councils uh, through, through early retirement, uh, normally to take up a quango someplace. Have you done any work on that? Um, we haven't carried out any specific work on, on turnover, but it is something we we keep an eye on because, um, I mean, if you look at IGBs, for example, um, there's quite a high turnover of senior management in IGBs, which, given the situation that IGBs are in, is, is clearly not a very helpful phenomenon. So it's something we, we look at, but we haven't. So, so we look at all senior departures individually as they happen. So as part of the annual audit work, the local auditors would always look at the circumstances surrounding the departure of a senior person. And, and indeed, uh, councils are required to disclose all of that in their remuneration report at, in every year. Um, I think increasingly, I'm, I'm just, I mean, this is very anecdotal, Mr Rowley, so you'll forgive me, but um, I can't think of that many actual early retirements that have been happening more recently. Um, so it's an interesting question you, you, you pose, and I'll, and I'll see if we can have a look at uh, what we know about about the nature of senior people um, leaving. But, but again, just to give the committee assurance that when and when and if and when it does happen, our local auditors are looking at those individual circumstances. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank Graham Sharp and uh, his colleagues for attending today's session. The committee will spend the remainder of the meeting considering this evidence in private. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,